In this session, we're going to look at a psalm of trust. Uh, psalms of trust are some of our favorite psalms, honestly. They're our go-to psalms whenever we're in a situation of crisis or fear or doubt. Uh, we love Psalm 16 that says, because the Lord is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I'll lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. He's with me in the valley of the shadow of death. He's my host at table. He fills my cup. He anoints my head. I want to live with him forever. Uh, Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? Uh, Psalm 31, 5, into your hands I commit my spirit. And verse 15, my times are in your hands, psalms of trust. And Psalm 63, it says, because your love is better than life, my lips will praise you. And there are many others, and these are the psalms that we go to in times of crisis. And my focus today is on a psalm of communal trust. Uh, there are also some songs that we pray together as a community, as a community of faith. Uh, these these uh, are found in book two. There's a group of psalms called uh, the Psalms of the Sons of Korah, Psalms 42 through 49. Now, the sons of Korah were uh, priests, uh, liturgists. They were uh, writers, worship leaders uh, in the temple. And uh, these psalms are all uh, in this same genre of a, of a communal prayer in many ways. Well, Psalm 46 is at the center of those prayers. And uh, we're not exactly certain when it happened, but many scholars think that that psalm can be dated to the time of Hezekiah. That would be about 700 BC. Now, Hezekiah was a king of Judah, and he was a very faithful king for the most part. He was a good king. And at this particular time in Israel's history, uh, there is a threat from the north, uh, the army of the Assyrians. Now, the Assyrians had already uh, come into the land about 21 years earlier, and they ravaged the northern kingdom. They carried away the 10 tribes into captivity. And uh, Hezekiah has been paying taxes. He's been a vassal state to the Assyrians. And he says, no more. God, you are God, we trust in you, and so we're gonna not pay taxes to the Assyrians. And if they get upset, and come to force the issue, we trust in you to take care of us. Well, the Assyrians did as expected and they wanted their money. And so they came down in 701 BC and they began uh, to, to overcome the villages and towns of Judah, causing the people to flee to the capital city of Jerusalem. And this may be when this Psalm was composed. And if so, the words are very appropriate because it begins with this statement about the nature of God. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. And we begin with these psalms of trust by stating what they tell us about the nature of God, and that is that God is refuge. God is our strength. God is our very present help in times of trouble. And there'll be many more of these qualities of God in these 11 verses of this psalm. Uh, because the Psalms of Trust are what I would call Psalms of Orientation. Uh, we said that laments are disorienting. They're those prayers that we pray when, when we're kind of lost and it doesn't make sense and when God is not acting as we think he should. But the Psalms of Trust are Psalms of Orientation because they remind us of who God is, what his nature is, and, and what he will do. And because of this reality, the psalmist continues in verse 2. He says, therefore, because of this truth, we will not fear, though the earth give way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Now, what the psalmist is describing here is, is literally the undoing of creation. On day three of creation, it says that God separated the land from the water. He formed the mountains and established a boundary that the waters could not cross. This psalm is describing the opposite of that. It is saying, what if those mountains went back into the sea? In other words, this is the worst possible scenario. This is, this is end of the world kind of language. This is catastrophic. And so the psalmists say, even if the very worst thing happens, we will trust. You are our refuge, our strength, and our help. The psalmist continues to describe in verse four another resource that God is. He says in verse four, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High a river. It's an interesting detail. There's some speculation about uh, what this river meant. 
In the ancient world, many cities were built upon rivers. In fact, that's what made them great civilizations. Egypt had the Nile, Babylon had the Euphrates, Rome, the Tiber. Israel, well, they had the Jordan, was not such a, a mighty river. And certainly Jerusalem did not have a river. It's up in the hill country of Judea. But what Jerusalem did have was a spring, a little spring in the south uh, of the town uh, called the Gihon. And we know that during the time of Hezekiah that that spring outside was connected to the city inside via a tunnel. The workers worked both directions and amazingly they met in the middle. And the people of the day saw that as a miracle, a sign that God was with them, that he provided them with this water source. So while the army of the Assyrians had surrounded the city, uh, they were not cut off without water because they had this spring, they had this source, they had this river that was sourcing them during this time. Uh, that's a possibility that that's the river that's referred to in verse four. It's also the possibility that it's just a, simply a metaphor for God himself. Uh, Babylon had the Euphrates, Rome had the Tiber, Egypt the Nile, but Israel had God himself. He was their river, he was their defense, he was their source of life. The text goes on to say not only that, but God has made himself at home. Jerusalem is his holy habitation. God built his house and God moved in to Jerusalem. He lives in the midst of his people. Verse five, he says, God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. That phrase, when morning dawns, is another clue that this psalm was possibly written during that time of the Assyrian invasion. Uh, because if you read the account of that invasion in Isaiah 37, uh, it describes uh, the taunting that went on between the Assyrian uh, general Sennacherib and, and Hezekiah and his men uh, from the city walls. And Hezekiah is defiant, he says, God is going to deliver us from this. We trust in him. They woke up the next morning. The people of Israel looked out from the city walls and they saw before them the camp of the Assyrians and there was no activity because in the night, the text says that the angel of the Lord put to death 185,000 men. A plague of some kind. We don't know how God did it. But Sennacherib, this mighty general, limped back to his home capital city of Nineveh, went to the temple of his God to offer a sacrifice, and there he was assassinated by his sons. Just like that, the mighty Assyrian empire tottered and crumbled. And in fact, that's the very next verse, verse six. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The Lord of hosts, the, the Hebrew word for host there is Sabaoth. It's often used of a host of angels in, in a military context, uh, angels that fight, battling angels. And indeed, that appears to be what the Assyrian army faced in the night was the Lord of hosts of angel armies that slew them. Not only that, but God is described here as a fortress a fortress, a place of refuge. The people of Judah had fled to Jerusalem behind its walls, its fortress, but God was ultimately their fortress. Proverbs 18 says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. The Psalm concludes with an invitation. In verse eight, it says, "'Come, behold the works of the Lord, "'how he has brought desolations on the earth, he makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, he shatters the spear, he burns the chariots with fire. The first invitation is to remember, to look back, to come and see, and to, to reflect on what God has done historically and trust in him. Look at what God has done in the past, how he's been with you and how he saved you and delivered you. Trust him in the present. Remember, come and behold what God has done. The second invitation is in verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Indeed, the most familiar words of this psalm are probably right there. Be still and know that I am God. In other words, rest, relax, be calm. Because God is sovereign. God is in control. He is all of this. We can trust in him. And indeed the city did. 
At morning, dawn, the army was gone. Now, I like to look at Psalms also through a New Testament lens to ask ourselves, okay, let's move forward 700 years. How is this Psalm perhaps experienced in the life of Jesus? And we don't have to go very far. We read in the first chapter of Matthew, as Jesus is introduced to us, the angel says his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is with us in the deepest possible sense. He became one of us, humbled himself, condescended to be with us in physical form in Jesus Christ. God is Emmanuel, God with us, our fortress. Not only that, but uh, Jesus had this to say about a river in John chapter seven. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the spirit as yet had not been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus says that there is a river as well that sources us. Uh, that river is one who is a paraclete, who, who walks alongside of us. That, that spirit is a comforter, uh, comfort to give fortitude, to strengthen us. Uh, that spirit, uh, it makes, its, makes his home inside of us. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 19 says that we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. The spirit is received uh, at our baptism, Acts 2, 38. So we have the very presence of God uh, making his home in, in, in our temple, in our bodies, with us, as the river of life that Jesus referred to flowing out of us. This psalm also makes me think of Jesus' words on the Sea of Galilee. You know the story, Jesus is asleep, he's exhausted, he's on the boat, and the disciples are there, and they're panicking because a storm has risen, and, and they're afraid they're going to die. And they wake Jesus up, and Jesus commands the storm and says, be still, be still. And you might think at that point that the disciples would say, that was close. Thank you. It was about time. But instead, the text says that the disciples at that moment feared a great fear. That's the Greek idiom. They were terrified. <laughs> they went from being afraid for their very lives to being terrified that they were in the boat with God, the God who commands the storm. They were with him in the boat. Be still and know that I am God. And finally, this psalm makes me think of resurrection. It says that God will help us at break of dawn. And I think about that Sunday morning when the women went to the tomb of Jesus to anoint him with spices, and they got there and they were surprised to find the stone had been rolled away. The body was gone. The tomb was empty. And it's a reminder of this amazing truth that when we go through death, that there will be a dawning. If we are in Christ, uh, when morning breaks, we will rise uh, with him. And that's good news. Uh, this psalm was the inspiration for one of the greatest hymns uh, in, in human language. It was written by Martin Luther, the great uh, reformer about 500 years ago. Ein Festeberg ist unser Gott. A mighty fortress is our God. As he reflected on this psalm and as he thought about how it relates to Jesus and the church in his context, he penned these words. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he, amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. And that word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. So let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth 
abideth still. His kingdom is forever. God is our refuge, strength, and ever-present help in trouble. So we can rest, we can relax, we can be still and know that he is God.